Today, I'm taking my heavily pregnant girlfriend on a fun day out. We're going to Tags Island on the River Thames where me, divers from my dive club and a very special guest have been invited to explore beneath the surface of this unique little island. I was first to arrive and meet Grant Braben, the majority owner of the island. Hey, Hi, Grant, how you doing? Good to see you, come on board. Thanks. Grant grew up on the island before departing to become a helicopter pilot and chase adventure all around the world. He now lives here full time and takes care of the maintenance and running of the island and the islanders. However, catastrophe struck in 2019 when his houseboat, the Helianthus, caught fire and sank. Grant lost everything. Now, standing on Grant's new boat, he was keen to see if me and the dive team could find any lost items not salvaged when the wrecked houseboat was recovered. The boat kind of went down here. Um, you can kind of see little bits of it still down there. Um, and when the sun shines down on it, you can kind of just, just see bits of it sticking out. And there's other parts of it that are kind of all the way down here. Um, and underneath, when the um, salvage crew came along, they came along with some big diggers and the whole boat had sunk, I think you've seen the photo of it. Yeah. Um, and they mashed it up with the diggers and pulled it onto a barge, which they took away and put into uh, skips and took it away. And so when the dust did settle, I could, I could definitely see still bits sticking out that, uh, that obviously they'd missed. It'd be quite nice to find out what's actually down there. Now, I'm no stranger to this island. I actually came here a few years ago. I came to visit my friend Ted, whose family owns a boat on the other side of the island. I took the opportunity to explore the waters alone with a free dive. As I swam to the bottom, I could see loads of shapes and objects. The problem was I couldn't hold my breath long enough to investigate thoroughly. With all that I'd discovered, I knew I had to come back here and explore it properly one day. It has been just the absolute tip of the iceberg. There is definitely so much to explore in this water. So uh, hopefully I'll be back in the not too distant future. Back to the future and divers from the Hackney Sub Aqua Club are arriving and it's time to get our gear sorted. But there was still one more diver to come. Tom, Gary, lovely to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. Gary Bankhead, ex-firefighter, current underwater archeologist, TV personality, author, YouTuber, and all round legend. Not only is he an honorary research associate at the Department of Archaeology, Durham University, he's a highly skilled scuba diver responsible for over 14,000 finds. Gary appears on TV's River Hunters, which is a great show and has had a big influence on me. Time to call in reinforcements. In the form of underwater archaeologist and Durham's sexiest man in 1988, Gary Bankhead. And it is. Oh. What's that? The end of a pipe? Yes. We're extremely lucky to have Gary here today. It's by coincidence that he was in the area giving an archaeological lecture and also recovering a lost wedding ring because of course he was. I can't believe it. Well chuffed, well chuffed. With the full team assembled, we gather for a safety briefing on the top of the boat with Jack, the club's dive manager. Um, we're going to go in in two waves. So we're always going to have some divers on the surface who are kitted up each group will have a datum so you'll have a line with a boy on it and a weight on the bottom and that will be your fixed point for doing your search. Scuba diving is a very risky activity. Even in the relatively shallow water of Tags Island, approximately three meters deep, locks can go wrong, especially in bad visibility. Prior to this day, we had practiced search drills at Hackney Sub Aqua Club's pool in Bethnal Green. As Jack explained, the plan is for a dive team of two to three people to execute circular search patterns around a central point covering the chosen area intensely while allowing the current to carry away any disturbed mud on the riverbed, in theory. Gary rounded off the safety briefing with some words of experience. The likelihood of finding artifacts here today is incredible. You've got to imagine throughout its history, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of vessels will have come up and down this, this section of the Thames and people will have dropped objects, they either accidentally lost deliberately thrown in and we will find a lot of things. We'll be laughing and joking about, wow, look at all of this stuff in a few hours time. Feeling excited, it was finally time to get kitted up and jump in.
With all the divers in the water, it was time to explore. As we descended, we were met with a lot of suspended particles, but the visibility was pretty good. We could see the riverbed well and objects started emerging as the eyes adjusted to this new environment. Oh, what have we got here? The finds started surfacing, although some not as interesting as others. Oh, Dishwasher wow. safe microwavable. <laughs> Clearly an ancient treasure. You recognise that grand yeah, little toolbox? Yeah. God, I had that when I was a kid. It used to be red. <laughs> really? Yeah. Honestly. Yeah, honestly, well, there's a kid's toolbox. It kind of folded out. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, there's a the handle. Fantastic. Look at that. The dive was going well, but with a lot of activity in the water, it was becoming a problem for visibility. The riverbed's littered with objects. You've just got to get ahead of the silt. Um, and when you do that, the visibility is really clear. I'm optimistic we'll find a few more things. Gary is a seasoned solo diver. He followed his intuition upstream and started uncovering loads of objects. What we've got is a sack, a sack of vessels. Some, they're um, nearly all intact, some amazing objects there. I'll, I'll, I'll scramble out and uh, let's go and have a good look, see what I found, eh? Fantastic. With dive one coming to an end, it was time to get out of the water and see what we'd got. Do you ever look at the stuff that the other divers brought up so far? before we come to your bag of, uh, bag of goodies. Bag of goodies. Yeah, yeah, of course. This actually, uh, when it came up, I recognised it straight away as a toolbox that I had as a kid, uh, given to me by my dad. It used to be red, kind of galvanised, um, hammerite metal, metal paint. I used to follow him around with my little tools, trying to help him out and do stuff. So uh, that was quite a shock to see that. And I recognised that straight away, just from the lips and the edges there that I used to catch my fingers on. The other thing I recognised straight away was this um, white bowl over here. I've actually got the rest of that set. That might polish up and go back and join the set. <laughs> is that, <laughs> that is so we found something from your boat. It's a bit useful. I mean, you can see all the fire marks on, the, on it, but oh, wow. well, who knows, maybe it could scrub up and that'll come yeah. clean again. Cool. Well, should we get to your bag yeah, of so goodies? It's an unusual metal ring. This bottle costs oh. 2p. Please rinse and return. Yeah, I wonder if that's still bad. Yeah. <laughs> well, a pop bottle. Stone, stoneware. This oh, one says oh, the Thames Ditton on it, yeah. Yeah, Thames. So this is local. So what would be in a bottle like this? Um, maybe ginger beer. Oh, yeah. Maybe ginger beer. Yeah. Um, what sort of age is that? Um, goodness, from the literally the reign of the Queen Victoria. Wow. Would have been still used and, and perhaps beyond, but to manufacture something heavy, chunky like that, um, takes a lot of effort and time and it's really heavy as well and um, quickly replaced by glass so so you've got 1950s 60s milk bottles old bottle of beer Queen Victoria um, what's that what would have been in that sugar flour jam that jam vessel yeah. so re really we're looking at things that are no more than 150 years old, if that's the oldest thing, but right. nothing of historical importance. But these small finds are captured that the activity yeah. of this location. Yeah. They tell the story of the food that people were drinking, the parties people had, occupation, activity, life, the history of you know this, the recent times of this, uh, this wonderful island. <laughs> To learn more about the history of this island, I visited an event held by the Maudsley Local History Society a few weeks before the dive. Thank you all very much for coming. History of Tags Island. The story of Tags Island is one of splendor, optimism and tragedy. The recorded history of the island begins in the mid-1800s when a property speculator bought the island from the Crown, as it had been part of the Crown estate, including nearby Hampton Court Palace. However, it's two men that make Tagg's history. First was a boat builder named Thomas Tagg, who leased the island for his business. He was very successful and expanded into hospitality, building a grand hotel and curating the island into the perfect destination for entertaining. It became frequented by royalty, nobility and celebrity. The island soon found itself at the centre of the social universe. The famous entertainment impresario Fred Carnot bought the island and built a new, bigger hotel with a huge music hall, tennis court, bowls court, croquet court and badminton court. 
a Dutch garden, German beer garden and a bandstand, raising the island to a whole new level of opulence and indulgence. But it was World War I that changed things forever. The rug of peace was pulled from beneath the feet of the genteel, refined patrons that had made Tags Island their favoured destination. The war had changed people's spirits, the river lost its attraction, the motor car replaced the boats, and the radio and cinema replaced the music hall. Times had changed. The island fell into darkness for decades to come until a group of houseboat owners, spearheaded by Grant's father, changed its fortunes. So the island has certainly seen a lot of change over the years. As we move on to our second dive on the other side of the island, I'm excited to see what's going to be hiding there, as historically this was the area where thousands of visitors would have first stepped onto Tags Island. It was nice and clear when we first jumped in. There were objects littered everywhere. We spread out and soon started bringing things up to the surface. So I have what is quite obviously a, a Grecian urn that's <laughs> travelled a very long um, way. signals um, all the time so I'm digging them out and I've got a pocket full of things I'm not sure what they are I knew what that was it's the bolt, bottom end of a bike large bolt nice piece of butchered animal bone and a tiny fragment of rib bone that might be a fragment of a human rib bone look how thin it is juvenile early uh, young adult so it's incredibly similar to a human rib bone Visibility was drastically declining and we were coming to the end of our second dive. It was time to get out and see what we had found. Dive two, over and done with. This, uh, this is an absolute eclectic mix of items. Similar but different to what we found on the other side. For me, what really stands out are the two animal bones that, that have came up. Initially, I thought that was a human rib bone because of the curvature, but on closer inspection, you can see that it's been cut. Uh, and similarly, this big chunk of animal bone, and you can see the socket where the, the joint was. God, it's got to be a pelvis or a hip yeah. bone. This one, very possibly a, a cow. One that interests me is this one. It's the first time I've seen it, really. Um, off a vessel rather than a car. Yeah, definitely. It's not a port or a starboard light, no. is it? It's, um, no, it's not. That's the weird one. It's not green or red. Old, it's lovely. new. What do you think? Well, it's got the electric wiring coming out. So, recent. S 60s through to the 90s, that yeah. sort of period. I like this personally because it's the uh, Thames Conservancy license that every boat used to have to have one of these. Oh, really? And uh, by comparison, so they'd send you one of these out and you'd have them all different vessels with them listed down there uh, for the years they'd been registered. Um, but now they just send you a piece of paper. So 1944, is that? I the, think that'd be the year, yes. That yeah, so. is the year of it? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. Oh, amazing. Oh, it's got some weight to it, it feels, yeah. uh, it feels yeah. good. Back in the day, the minute it meant something to get your view yeah. license. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. That, that is special, that. From, from the, the time of the Second World War. Yeah. yeah. This is quite interesting. It's a hand forged uh, wall spike, so iron. It's quite a length. It's got a sort of sub-circular head, almost square head. So for me, that could be a couple of hundred years old. Wow. Really? Yeah, what yeah. What would they be used for? For pinning back sections of wall or? Yeah, or, or timber right. um, abutments, you know, the, the edging of, of the river. Uh, this thing uh, down here. Why does this have any significance to you there, Gary? Yes, um, I recognise that straight. And it's, it's coloured red. <laughs> um, this appears to be almost certainly uh, the foot of a stirrup pump. 
when I used to be in the fire and rescue service all of those years ago, we used to carry them uh, little stirrup pumps and basically you would put the hose end in water or in a bucket and you would put your foot on there and pump the water out and squirt it wherever you. During the Second World War, uh, they would have these uh, for incendiary bombs that came down. Right. Yeah, they're very portable, you get to the scene of the fire relatively quickly um, and use always water close by to, to yeah. extinguish the fire. Do yeah. you think this might be from that period? Oh, almost certainly Second World War, yeah. 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 Okay. I mean... The, Things are shaping up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, croc the crockery, the bottles, you know, it is that second half of the uh, 20th century that we're potentially looking at. That's not bad. We still have a story, you know, of the island that's been laying there for yeah. up to 200 years. Yeah. It's pretty good. It is fascinating. And the conflicts, the wars that took place, you yeah. know, um, in the meantime, the coronations, the kings and queens who will have passed by, um, all represented in these, in these, <laughs> objects. these objects. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Well, yeah. thanks very much, guys. Yeah, it's been, thank you. it's been great fun. The dives today may not have revealed ancient treasures, but it was a great day out and a chance to peek into the not too distant past of a different England. I still feel like there is a lot more to find down there, so watch this space. <laughs>